Good afternoon and welcome to the Global ESCO Network's launch of its recent publication, The Regulatory Areas for Energy Service Companies, which is in fact just out of the press, we just have it here, just half an hour ago. Uh, that is the publication that we are presenting today. We are broadcasting from the UN city in Copenhagen. You can see our iconic staircase behind me. Um, this is where we are uh, having, up, having set up our, our offices um, and where we work from, um, and also where we have now uh, produced the publication that we're launching today. I'm not here alone. We have uh, three speakers uh, with us who have been participating in the development of um, the, the publication, um, having been part of the analysis that is the foundation for the publication. Um, we will come back to our speakers later. Uh, I will first make a short presentation on our findings of the regulatory barriers uh, for energy service companies throughout the world. So I will share my screen. Uh, so, as I said, uh, my name is Søren Lutken. I'm uh, the co-chair of the Global ESCO Network, um, and uh, I will take you through this short presentation of our publication. First, though, I will just give you one minute about the Global ESCO Network, which was uh, formally established in 2019, commencing our activities in the middle of 2020, um, in the middle of um, the corona crisis. So we have actually built up the organization while... Um, the world has been more or less shut down. Um, we were created to bring ESCOs onto the global climate change agenda through a concerted effort uh, backed by all existing ESCO associations. So that means we are we are focusing on the ESCO associations and not the ESCOs. Uh, and by now we have managed to organize uh, 31 out of uh, 38 national and regional ESCO associations. Um, we are anchored, as I mentioned, in, um, in the UN city in Copenhagen and the Copenhagen Climate Center. Um, uh, and we initiate research and uh, policy advocacy in global and national fora. And of course, today's book launch is part of this uh, research work. We believe, and we are working for others to share that belief with us, that ESCOs are the instrument that makes energy efficiency potentials tangible and that ESCOs have been overlooked in international climate change advice. And finally, that ESCOs offer the best returns on any climate change motivated action. Mm -hmm. So visit us uh, at our website, globalesconetwork.org, uh, for further uh, details. The regulatory barriers for energy service companies publication that we're launching today is based on interviews with 12 ESCO associations. We will hear, as I mentioned before, more details uh, from three of those. Um, and we have done that uh, an explorative uh, interview uh, session with, with these 12 uh, ESCO associations uh, to end up identifying 10 regulatory barriers, more or less, where we, so the overall conclusion uh, we have to draw is that there is no ideal jurisdictions around. Nobody has gotten the, the ESCO framework, the regulatory framework for ESCOs right yet, but uh, it's also clear that some are definitely better than others. Now, why do we only focus on regulatory barriers? Well, the reason uh, is um, that we are a policy-linked or related organization, as I said, we are hosted here in the UN city in Copenhagen. We work with policymakers and uh, we believe that uh, we should also focus on those barriers that we are closest uh, to provide the, uh, sort of, or to discuss uh, with, with the, our usual uh, counterparts. So for that reason, we, we believe that the regulatory uh, barriers that are faced by ESCOs um, is our, or should be our prime focus. The 12 countries that we have um, analyzed are listed here, from Australia to the left, to UK on the right. We have the 12 countries listed here. And we uh, show also our assessment of whether barriers are uh, direct obstacles to ESCOs or whether they are just providing suboptimal conditions. And of course, if um, 
in those cases that, that are also the case, that there are favorable conditions for operating ESCOs. And you can see the distribution here. Uh, some countries are certainly better than others, as I mentioned. And the three countries we are uh, looking at today would be Canada, Portugal, and United Arab Emirates uh, are sort of in the middle of the field. So they are not the best, but they're definitely not the worst either. But we will hear from, from the uh, ESCO associations from those three countries uh, just in a couple of minutes. We developed a new typology um, so that we do not only look at regulation which is specifically focused on ESCOs, of which there is in fact quite little. We normally find that ESCOs uh, happen to uh, have uh, or get into to conflict with the regulations that are in fact not specifically targeted ESCOs. Um, we have identified three uh, barriers that uh, affect uh, ESCOs, could say by accident. Another three, which are uh, sort of, uh, result of specific regulation targeted ESCOs. And then uh, a new creation of ours or a, a new uh, version uh, of barriers of ours that we have uh, developed for this publication, which is barriers in the absence of regulation. And that sounds a bit weird. Because, well, what, what company wouldn't uh, want a regulation that imposes the use of its product? But we, we look at barriers in the absence of regulation from the perspective that where countries have found that a regulation is a benefit to uh, the ESCO market, that the absence of that uh, regulation in other markets could be considered a barrier. We know it's stretching a bit, stretching the, the, the barriers definition a bit, but it has turned out to be quite uh, useful in this uh, respect. Um, and we hope you will agree with us that is actually uh, also an interesting observation uh, or interesting observations that we're doing in, in this particular regard. But for that, of course, you would have to dive further into uh, the publication. I'm not going to, to reveal all the results of what, what, we, have, what we have dug out uh, through the interviews with the ESC associations. Very briefly, we are, we are presenting the results in three tables. Um, and those three tables are also divided, of course, on those three categories that, that we are that, that we have defined here. Uh, and as you can see, we are listing the countries and, uh, and uh, the specific types of regulations and gives a, a, uh, an easy overview of which regulations are um, generally not considered a big issue and which ones are more problematic. I will, will not go into uh, the specific barriers here, just illustrating uh, what exactly well, how, how, is, how is the publication structured? And I hope we will get into the discussion of the concrete barriers in our Q&A session um, after the presentations from our three uh, country partners. We have with us, as I mentioned today, Stuart Galloway from uh, the Energy Services Association of Canada, uh, who will start presenting first, followed by Jorge Rodriguez de Almeida from APESA in uh, Portugal, and finally, uh, Ahmed El Bambali from uh, the Clean Energy Business Council in the uh, United Arab Emirates will present uh, also uh, the UAE version of barriers for, for ESCOs. I will um, hand over the microphone to uh, Stuart and step back here. Uh, I should mention to you, though, that if this is the start of our, our debate or Q&A session. So you can submit your uh, questions. So just type your, your, your questions in and I will, um, I will uh, present the questions to our speakers uh, after their presentations. So Stuart, uh, over to you. Hello everybody. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, you'll be hopefully happy to hear that I only have the one slide. Um, and I'm the current CEO for Energy Services Association of Canada. Uh, I've been that for about four and a half years, took over from uh, somebody that was a brilliant guy and uh, big shoes to fill, but we've made some progress in Canada and we were happy to contribute to the uh, development of this document. Um, we have, uh, as Soren said, maybe we're somewhere in the middle of the pack, not so sure. Sometimes it doesn't seem like that, but I guess everybody uh, is probably in the similar shoes. Um, so we only have a certain amount of time, so we're just going to move straight into the presentation. So this is specific to Canada, but I do believe this will resonate across uh, a number of different jurisdictions. 
Um, but for time's sake, I do intend to speak more about the government-led energy efficiency procurements and initiatives. And uh, not all of this will uh, will actually apply to private, commercial, and industrial sectors. But there is a fair bit of overlap, um, and you'll probably guess which. Um, so I'm just going to, by way of a little bit of background, and this does add to some of the issues that we face, we actually have uh, four levels of government inc. across Canada, and it's a large jurisdiction, as you can imagine. Um, and that doesn't include the Aboriginal governments that we also have overlaid in that, and that's another layer of complexity all to itself. Um, so we actually have federal, provincial, regional, and municipal, and they're in that order as they come down the list um, and become smaller and smaller as you can work through that. So each level can actually be a different political party heading it up, and each has different funding models and all can be pulling in a different direction. So uh, a very recent example that uh, made a lot of headlines was that we had uh, some of the provincial governments took on the federal government, um, actually took them to court over the imposition of carbon pricing. Now, the provincial governments lost because it was deemed that it was a national thing and uh, should be led by the feds. Um, so basically, that meant that the feds were able to impose their requirements around carbon pricing across all of the provinces. Um, the provinces could adapt something within a window of parameters that matched it, but basically it was imposed. Um, so that's how crazy it is. We actually end up fighting and taking each other to court at different levels of government over, over what is essentially a good thing. Um, so at federal level, we actually have something called the Federal Building Initiative, FBI, and that's been running since the 1990s. And you think, well, that's easy then. That's, that just flows across all levels of government. But we don't actually have anything that is equivalent to that lower down in government. And this document actually encourages the use of EPCs across all levels of government, but it doesn't compel them to do it. Even at federal level, it doesn't compel them to do it. Um, it's almost like you, you can choose to do it. And they even have a whole department that's actually dedicated to educating the ministries around edu uh, energy performance contracting. So other levels could use the FBI standard documents and their qualified bidders list, but they choose not to. And equally, they do not have a standard view that EPCs are beneficial um, and can especially benefit their retrofits, um, and particularly as we chase net zero these days. So no real estate managers are, re uh, sorry, so real estate managers are reluctant to bring projects forward as they seem complex and there's no internal pre-approval anywhere across Canada below federal level to this approach. So constant education is required. With that lack of education and a lack of standardization, it means that our mistakes are often repeated throughout procurements and contracts as they take from the last document they've seen on the market and try and adapt it. And that leads to other issues on the grounds. And it's, uh, you know, with the ESCOs themselves, if it's a bad document and a bad contract, and that can often lead to a bad taste towards the ESCOs. Oh, we had a bad experience with an ESCO once. We don't want to do that form of procurement. And often huge crazy time-consuming procurement cycles, two years, two, two plus years sometimes, um, just and, and very, very expensive to bid as well. Um, so this is also linked locally to the issue of split incentives. Uh, many times, if the real estate division saves its operational dollars in an energy performance contract, that budget is then reduced the following year to reflect the reduced consumption. And that leaves them exposed then to continue to pay the ESCO financing. And this incentivizes them to pursue their own internal capital dollars instead, rather than third-party financing, which in turn limits the throughput of projects, uh, reduces the scope, and often leads to the uh, what we all know as the low-hanging fruit projects um, with shorter-term shorter, shorter -term paybacks, although hopefully we're even starting to run out of those now. And this issue is exacerbated when we have one ministry responsible for the property management and another occupying and effectively paying the rent. So the, the split incentive scenario uh, at its core. So one benefit we've seen of the carbon pricing 
is that governments at all levels are slowly overcoming their hereditary institutional approach, and they're waking up to the fact that they cannot do everything themselves from the public coffers and with using uh, traditional design bid-build contracts. So to avoid paying the carbon pricing, they're being forced to consider deeper dive retrofits with longer-term considerations, but it is slow going. Uh, in Canada, we actually have a saying, uh, if you can't commit, committee. Um, and we're very good at that. We reinvent committees at all levels of government to look at the issue over and over again. And then just when we think we've got there, we form it again. So like anyone, we have incentive programs to find energy efficiency inside buildings. But we actually often have national programs with dollars available. And they will conflict with the provincial programs and their dollars available. And often you can't have both working to the same project. The timing of the influx of that money can generate cash flow issues that need to be resolved locally. Uncertainty on approvals delay project generation, the old chicken and egg situation. And just to say as a, an ironic moment, um, despite many provinces having a minister of red tape reduction, the approvals processes can take so long that they outweigh the savings that they would have had in the interim process. So as ESAC, Energy Services Association of Canada, I, as I am sure a lot of you will have the same, this is where we spend a lot of our efforts in reducing and removing these aspects, education, raising awareness, and hopefully smoothing the way. So thank you very much and look forward to the questions. I'll end slideshow. Do you want to take control back? Thank you very much, Stuart, um, for this presentation where we at least got uh, the headings of some of the uh, regulatory barriers that um, that are adopted in um, in our publication, like uh, the split incentives, for instance, and the contracts that that uh, uh, form. Uh, well, Particularly, the split incentives are quite prevalent uh, throughout the countries that we have um, analyzed. Good. Um, next in line is uh, Jorge from uh, PESA. And to all of you, please remember that you can still post your questions on, on the tab um, on your screen. Thank you very much. Jorge, over to you. So uh, my name is Jorge. I represent the Portuguese associations of ESCOs. The Portuguese association is... Um, rather small association compared to others uh, because we are a small country and the ESCO market in Portugal is not so big as in other countries. Um, for instance, if we compare with Spain, that is the, the country just close to, to us, the, the market there is um, quite bigger than our market. Uh, still, we gather the main um, ESCO's um, companies and um, together with them, we usually talk with the government about these barriers and try to, to break them. So uh, moving to what um, brings us here is about barriers and things that slow down the market and things that slow down the pace that we need uh, for this um, this um, demand on energy efficiency, on renewables, etc. that we all know about it. First, um, about legislation. So. Um, there is a lack of legislation and regulation uh, that promote the energy performance market. So there is a lot of legislation on uh, energy efficiency, on renewables, as in all the countries. But then there is a lack of uh, clearly stating that uh, performance contracts can be an option or should be an option. Also, uh, when there is uh, legislation, sometimes they made it quite, quite complex. A good example is um, when it comes to contracts uh, with uh, public entities. So there is a, a model of the contract, but it's uh, way too complicated to be used. That For that reason, it was never used in the building sector. It was a, a kind of adapted to the street lighting, which is um, the low-hanging fruit of this process. It's quite simple. Um, so it was adapted for this, and it was developed on, on street lighting, but nothing happened when it comes to public buildings because the contract, the legislation, this public procurement process, it was way too complex uh, for both entities, for the ESCOs, but also 
for the public entities to open this, this process. Also, um, we, we understand that there is um, a lack or, or, or absence of a positive fiscal policy when it comes to the, the service contracts. Uh, this is just a, a, a small example. But for instance, uh, we have uh, de decreased um, the VAT rate for the energy because of the costs of the energy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for instance, on the residential sector. So uh, you have a lower VAT uh, when it comes to residential sector on the energy than you have on the services that you provide. So this is uh, um, the kind of things that will not push for the market because there is a, a you lose money by doing this type of, of changing, moving from buying the energy to buy uh, services. So, so that's a thing that needs to be changed. And also positive incentives are, are quite relevant in order to promote this, uh, this, uh, this market. Last, uh, last point is related with the funds. So there are a lot of funds in Portugal, uh, structural funds, now the resilience and recovery funds. So a lot of money flowing from the European uh, Union or the European Commission to, to Portugal in different ways, uh, but they are not designed in the way that they can promote energy service contracts. And, and um, also, this is uh, very, very relevant for us. Um, when they are presented, they talk about a lot of money that will flow to the industry or to the building sector for energy efficiency. And these are our grant money. So there will be some, some part of, the, of this money that will be a grant. Of course, all the owners of the buildings or industry owners, they will delay their, their investments or they will postpone their investments waiting for these, uh, um, for these funds. So we say that governments are quick to, to announce the financing schemes. Uh, however, they are not so quick when they want to um, kind of operating this, this into the ground or making um, them uh, working and uh, at the end of the day promoting the energy efficiency that is the, the, the end result. And uh, this leads us to something that can, can be strange or can uh, um, be seen as strange, but happens a lot of times that the payback of certain investments are shorter than the, the time that takes for these funds to be available, these public grants or, or public funds to be available. So that's why we say that it's really important that when this public money that makes difference, it's, it's relevant for a country like Portugal, uh, uh, but there is a need to make sure that they are promoted whenever they are ready to go to, to the ground, whenever they are ready to be invested by the, the, the end users, not in a way that they stop the market for several months and sometimes years uh, because people are waiting for these funds that will be available. So those are, are some of the, keys, the key barriers that we, we find. Um, and I think that um, I also resemble with the presentation from Canada. I think that uh, we all face the same issues here, but uh, on the debate, we will have plenty of time to discuss uh, a little bit more these these types of barriers. Thank you very much, Jorge, for for uh, for this additional uh, presentation of, of additional barriers compared to uh, to Stuart. We are we are filling up on the shelves of, of those ten barriers that that we have identified in our publication, and I look forward to discussing them um, after our last intervention from uh, Ahmed Abavali uh, from the UAE. So, Ahmed, over to you. Thank you, sir, and uh, thanks so much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and a good day. Uh, I don't know where you are. Uh, just a quick introduction. I'll take exactly uh, five minutes overall. Um, so I represent uh, the Clean Energy Business Council. We are not an ESCO association, but we are uh, being an ESCO association as part of our mission uh, or part of the activities we do. So, But we cover other sectors other than energy efficiency as well, including climate finance, low carbon hydrogen, energy storage, energy efficiency, and um, uh, sustainable mobility. So CEBC, the organization I represent, the Clean Energy Business Council, it's a not-for-profit membership industry association uh, based out of the UAE, uh, but we cover uh, the Middle East and North Africa region, MENA region. And uh, when CEBC started uh, 17 years ago, the, the idea is to uh, build a dialogue, a platform that would enhance dialogue between the private sector and the governments across uh, the MENA countries 
to discuss the policy challenges and try to accelerate the policy maturity across the different clean energy topics across MENA. And accordingly, we have very strong relationship between uh, with the government entities as well as, well as the private sector across the different sectors I just mentioned. Uh, we organized a lot of events, we organized a lot of policy dialogues to discuss policy issues, we publish a lot of research and reports covering the different topics I mentioned. And all of the research we publish is completely for free. So if you haven't heard, heard about us before, please. Um, so if you haven't seen any of our previous research, please go to our website. We have annual publications covering the different uh, aspects of energy efficiency across MENA. We cover most of the countries in MENA and we keep tracking the data so and updating those publications on an annual basis. So please make sure that you visit our website and subscribe to our newsletter to receive the updates about the uh, energy efficiency sector of this MENA as well as the other topics as well. I just to give a very uh, high level uh, overview, so we do an annual uh, ESCO survey. So that is a survey that we send out to all of the ESCOs uh, and we focus specifically on the GCC for that specific for that survey. Hopefully, uh, the idea is to expand the scope to the other North African countries in the next year, uh, 2023. But until now, the focus has been on the GCC. So I try to extract the data on the UAE only since the focus on the UAE. Uh, but if you want to understand what's happening across GCC, you can go to the website and find aggregated data for GCC. Uh, so this is the data from the ESCOs in the UAE. So uh, the left side shows uh, how old are the ESCOs. So you see that most of the ESCOs are actually less than five years old. And that's because the whole ESCO market is very new to the region. And um, uh, I think now we are starting to see uh, a lot of traction for the market. But generally, it's a very new uh, business uh, for the whole region, not just the UAE. UAE is actually the leading country in terms of encouraging and um, incentivizing uh, energy efficiency. So I, I believe that would be much less even other countries across GCC and MENA. And if you look at those ESCOs, uh, a lot of them are not actually only ESCOs. They are doing other activities as well. So if you, if you want to understand... Uh, how, uh, because some of them have been emerged during uh, this focus on ESCOs, but some of them actually were facility management companies, but they found then that there's an opportunity to be an ESCO, then they started to be an ESCO, uh, uh, aside, like along with their main business uh, and operations. So only 38% eight, eight, uh, of the total companies we surveyed in the UAE are actually pure ESCOs. But the rest is a uh, different uh, type of companies, whether it's facility management companies, product manufacturers, and sometimes product retailers as well. And if you look at where are most of these ESCOs are based, uh, so uh, most of them are active within the UAE, Abu Dhabi, uh, sorry, within Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Ras al Khaimah. So the way, I don't know if some of you uh, don't understand how the UAE is um, uh, composed at seven emirates, like you have seven different states, and each emirate usually would have its own uh, government, uh, local government, but they also have the federal government with uh, some specific rules and regulations. Uh, so you have three uh, of the emirates are very active within energy efficiency, and we see that most of the projects are coming from these emirates as well. And the other emirates are somehow active, but not as uh, equal to this um, uh, uh, three main emirates. 50% uh, of the UAE ESCOs uh, are planning, uh, have plans to open, uh, have already opened a branch in other MENA countries, specifically Saudi Arabia. And that's actually 70% of the respondents uh, are actually interested in Saudi Arabia, and others are also interested to open offices in Egypt and Oman. And that's these are UAE based ESCOs, but they are interested to expand the operations to other markets outside of the UAE as well. Uh, that explains the front points why the uh, the companies are doing this, and they will come to this uh, shortly. Uh, some other countries uh, that uh, companies are somehow interested in, but perhaps the interest is very, very much uh, lower. And that's because mainly the tariff, the electricity tariff is very cheap, so there is no specific incentive or economical incentive for the building owners to, uh, to uh, go to energy efficiency programs and uh, applications. This is uh, this graph shows the level of optimism from the ESCOs we surveyed uh, in the UAE-based ESCOs uh, for the whole MENA market, if they are willing to expand for the whole MENA market, which markets they are interested in, or they see that there's high potential in. And uh, mainly we will look at the blue and purple colors. Uh, this would be the maybe the positive markets, the markets with the highest potential. So you see that it's mainly Abu Dhabi, uh, Dubai, 
uh, Oscar Khayma within the UAE, then you go to um, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, mainly. So I think it's mainly those uh, three markets. Perhaps the other markets are somehow uh, still uh, picking up. Uh, now I think we will start to see more within Egypt. And uh, not only for the lo- local companies based on these countries, but also for the UAE companies to expand. So two-thirds of the ESCOs we, sur- we, we uh, uh, surveyed see that the ESCO um, uh, business is somehow good or very good, uh, but the rest are not very happy. The, the other one-third are not very happy with the performance of the ESCO businesses, whether it's fully ESCOs uh, or they have ESCOs as part of their uh, businesses and along with other different activities. Um, that shows that there are some challenges and actually a lot of challenges that we need to tackle to actually to reach to the point that companies see the potential and are willing to expand the operations even within the country and they can evaluate the performance as uh, even everyone would be good. Uh, in the UAE, specifically 70, 57% of the ESCOs uh, find that uh, the UAE market has not been that good, uh, specifically during the last two years, and that's mainly for the different reasons. When the market started, what, there was a lot of changes, there was a lot of incentives, there was a lot of focus from the government entities. But now we, we see that this uh, focus has been going down a little bit. And some of the emits, perhaps some, some of the other emits are still even just starting, so it's, it's very positive. But overall, the companies, uh, the ESCOs are not very happy. Uh, you see that that's over 50% of the ESCOs see that the, the, the market is not good. And accordingly, some of them are actually even relocating to other markets or moving some of their teams to other markets across the region. We'll mention the reasons as well uh, in a second. 60% of the ESCO think the UAE is going to be good uh, or very good in the long term, and that's for different reasons. Uh, if you haven't been following, so UAE is one of the three countries across the region that have announced a net zero target by 2050. And uh, UAE is also going to host COP28 in uh, 2023. Those are specific announcements and policy mandates that will have or will encourage the government to provide more incentives for energy efficiency companies and for buildings, whether they are government, governmental, residential or commercial, to look into how they can reduce their energy consumption and tend to use uh, or uh, use the energy efficiency programs. I was trying to find the high resolution picture of this one. Uh, it's our publication, but it has been a while, so... I found the low resolution, but you can find high resolution online for sure on our website. This basically shows you the uh, the current challenges for the ESCOs in the UAE specifically. So the number, the, 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 the key two challenges that we see are the client willingness. So most of the clients, whether they are building owners, or sometimes the clients might be, like when we see the client here, it's actually mainly the decision maker who is eventually taking the decision to approve a, a, a retrofit or a building a, an energy efficiency program or not. So that could be a, the, the facility manager or director of engineering or the building owner himself. Uh, regardless of who is that uh, person, there is lack of willingness of that client to go for energy efficiency. Although financially it makes perfect sense, but that willingness has many different um, uh, components uh, that actually uh, are part of this sometimes because they are too lazy to actually change the operations or they think it's too good to be true or sometimes they think it's uh, uh, if, if we can if, if the engineering team sometimes they see this they have to create uh, internal resistance because if you can save energy that most likely could mean that the energy te- the, the, the engineering team is not doing their job which is not the case but sometimes that's the perception so that creates uh, a big issue with the client willingness. Uh, that could it change by uh, the government mandating these changes uh, or this energy efficiency uh, programs and targets? Uh, could it change by also uh, creating more awareness uh, campaigns and awareness sessions? Uh, this webinar is one of them, uh, but targeted to really this uh, specific segment of clients and people, uh, the, the, the building owners, the facility managers, everyone is actually engaged or uh, somehow uh, in the charge of taking such decisions within the organizations. The other one is uh, the complexity of the ESCO contracts. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of cases that uh, the, ESCO, the energy efficiency program is too simple and accordingly a complicated contract that is 
uh, specifying the terms and conditions that is usually used for a very complex project wouldn't apply to. So having really that custom uh, escrow contract that would make it easier for the client to actually understand and sign off uh, is one of the challenges that usually uh, ends up having these clients have a fear of signing these contracts and they tend to uh, not understand. Even the lawyers sometimes don't even understand the complexity of these contracts. So customizing contracts that are simple enough based on the project is a key uh, challenge as uh, as well, and um, something that uh, requires some work in the UAE. The third challenge that we see is the lack of project funding. That's not usually, that's not always the case, I think, but ge generally, um, that's one of the challenges. Uh, ESCO sometimes have to get uh, loans uh, with high interest, uh, which we see that doesn't make sense because you are doing, uh, eventually, that's a clean energy project that has an environmental and social impact, not just economical impact. So we um, uh, we are advocating to have more uh, government funds and uh, special fi um, uh, uh, financing instruments for the energy efficiency projects. The, the, the fourth biggest challenge is really the number of ESCOs, uh, ESCO tenders. Uh, that's not a lot of them. And accordingly, uh, with the expectations of the ESCOs and the plans they had, uh, sometimes the, uh, we, there are some plans from the governments across the UAE that there are specific high targets for the, for the country. But if we look at practically what's happening across the years, that perhaps is much less than uh, what, uh, what was announced. And accordingly, the companies, when they started their businesses or uh, uh, being active with the ESCOs, they started based on expectations which haven't been uh, materialized. Uh, some other challenges like the, the, the client li 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 liquidities in the markets, uh, the policy and regulations, the quality of the ESCO services that are currently active, uh, and confusions in the markets as well. Who is doing uh, ESCOs? Who are the actual ESCOs? Uh, this is perhaps something that has been tackled already by creating a specific database, etc. Uh, this slide shows some of the change, sh changes that could be could have been made, but we'll share the slides with you. And again, you can head to the uh, website to find all uh, the details. Uh, uh, there are a few slides about the landscape of the super ESCOs. Uh, there's something quite unique about the region. Uh, super ESCO is a government-owned uh, company that is responsible to coordinate the projects uh, for retrofitting the government buildings. And that, that has been a very successful model, which has been replicated across different countries across the region as well. Uh, the next few slides show some of the data and accomplishments by this, the, this different super ESCOs. And again, the slides will be shared and you can find all of these details in our publications on the website. And with that, I would stop here and give it back to you. So I thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Um... And I think we, we almost have a full full score now on, on all the, the, the regulatory barriers that we have that we have identified in um, in our publication. Before I go to to um, to asking you one the same question for all three of you, I have got one question from from the audience, which is um, if if we should point to one one single barrier, which is the most important one that that we can observe across all countries that we've observed. Um, which one would that be then? I think it's it's maybe it's in fact apart from the split incentives that that uh, that uh, uh, Stuart talked in, uh, out in the beginning, uh, which is would be quite partic <laughs> particularly difficult to to do something about. Contract formats seem to be uh, one the, the one main thing uh, that everybody agrees on is a challenge, and may also be the easiest one to actually address. Uh, but but that's just picking one, and it's, it, and it's not. It's a very nuanced uh, picture that we have. Um, so, I will switch from the audience questions right now, and just to ask one question to get the discussion also just started among you. If you well, in 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 the in the the work that you have done so far uh, on uh, promoting escrows or, or dismantling maybe uh, regulatory barriers for escrows, what what have you been doing and what have been your interactions with um, with uh, the regulatory authorities in order to to build down the um, the regulations? Uh, and I know Stuart, you mentioned already that you have no gone to court, uh, uh, but we may also have less less. Um, uh, severe uh, approaches to to establish a dialogue with uh, with uh, regulatory authorities. Over to all three of you. Maybe maybe Stuart, you will start. 
Oh, sure, thanks. Um, yeah, actually, just to clarify, it was the provincial government that took the federal governments to court. Uh, provincial governments, there were several of them, took the federal government to court about that. But yeah, it wasn't us. We, we weren't involved. Um, yeah, so so what what do we do to engage? Um, one is we, we seem to have an awful lot of um, lobbying organizations across Canada, all lobbying for GHG reduction, all lobbying for uh, energy efficiency and carbon pricing and all the good stuff that we talk about. So one of the big things that we do is, is try and um, coordinate with them so that we're actually all coming with one message. Um, and there's a couple of organizations that are much bigger than us, like Efficiency Canada and BOMA and such, that actually help with that messaging. And that's, that's the biggest one. And then the other one is literally education. Um, we try and work particularly with the federal. I mentioned there's a department in the feds that's, that's used for educating across the federal government. So we coordinate with them to try and get provincial governments and we target sort of the big ones because we're just too small to target everybody. There's nine provinces. Um, so we, we we use those to target those um, and educate them. Um, it's not. Um, I, I think it was Ahmed uh, actually mentioned the the it's too good to be true scenario. The amount of times we hear that, uh, oh, it's too good to be true, or oh, I once had a bad experience, or I don't understand ESCO contracts. Um, so it's trying to get rid of some of those myths, trying to just educate, and it's a hard slog. It's a hard slog. So we, we get these other partnering groups to try and educate on our behalf as well. So that's that's one of the big things that we do. Thanks, Stuart. And hopefully, would you, would you respond to the same question, maybe? So basically, uh, um, Portugal has, um, is a small country, so we don't have this issue of federal and, uh, and national government. So we have the national government and localities or municipalities. Um, but the law, when it comes to... to ESCO's contracts in public uh, buildings, for instance, is uh, mainly a, um, a government law. So it's um, it's with whom we try to to do some work. As, as Stuart was saying, um, there are other associations or other entities or organizations also promoting the energy efficiency market. This the, the reductions of greenhouse gases, so all of those. So we try to to work also with them in a way that we have one voice. Because that's that's um, quite quite important. Um, what we are seeing at the moment in in Europe, there is this um, huge amount of new regulation or um, that comes to to answer, um, for instance, to the war, uh, uh, to the invasion of Russia to to Ukraine. So there is a lot of regulation that tries to to answer to that in a, in a, in a quick way. Um, so it's not easy for for us to try to. To at the same time do our our lobby or try to to support the government in these decisions because things are are moving moving very very fast at the moment. But basically, what we try to do is to to have this um, use the same message and try to to let people know that if we have a contract where there is a guarantee of the savings or where there is a guarantee of the performance, that's the best way to achieve. The, the indicators and um, the targets that we have as a country. Thanks a lot. I mean, there's, there's one question to you right here uh, from the audience. Uh, there's, there's a question about the uh, recently introduced 15 years um, regulatory. Uh, where, where did it go now? A 15 years rule for EPC in the public sector that was recently introduced is. Does that ring any bell to you? So uh, I cannot see the question here for some reason, but but um, so so uh, it rings a bell on the fact that there is this when it comes to public uh, public procurement. Um, so there is this regulation, and it states uh, that contracts must be, or it it was written there that contracts must be between seven to fifteen years, or or twelve years, something like this, um, which is not often the case. Um, because there are contracts that can be shorter than that, uh, but that was um, an indicative number. That was one of the, um, um, I think that one of the key points that uh, we need to overcome in Portugal. This is not just about energy efficiency; it's more, more global. But is the fact that whenever there is a law, the law goes into the details or try to detail everything, and then when you try to use the law, you see that there was one detail that you cannot use because it was too detailed, you know, and for your specific case, 
it does not work. So this is a, a kind of example where you try to put all the, the details in the log, and then uh, sometimes it does not work because you have too much details. Um, the reason why they choose this number, uh, I don't know. Uh, um, there was someone should study it, but uh, it wasn't as the, the association because we were not invited um, for for this uh, regulation with where we should be because actually we are uh, the associations of these companies that will develop these types of contracts. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jorge. And, and that may be the one the one thing that 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 will the challenge that we have that we are often. Or the ESCO associations are often not uh, invited for for the dialogues that, that are relevant to their operation. Uh, Ahmed, but how how does it look uh, in, in the UAE? Are, are how are you engaging with the with the authorities in order to to improve the regulatory environment for the ESCOs? So I have to say, uh, the UAE government is the open. Like usually, they like to listen and the we have the target to be. Uh, to make the business open for everyone, is happy. And that's good. And so, uh, whenever we request to uh, sit down, and discuss policies, they're usually very responsive. But I think what needs to happen for us to really flourish again and uh, still be the leader, uh, I think I can summarize two things. One, it has to be mandated by the government, and that there's a lot of subpoly points under the it's mandated by the government, whether it's private sector or government buildings. Uh, there will be allocated funds, whether it's from uh, the government or from the company, to do the energy efficiency. Luckily, the energy efficiency programs make sense financially, so they actually will get the return. Uh, that might be uh, a bigger challenge with uh, other sectors where it actually doesn't make sense financially, but luckily it, it does make sense financially for the energy efficiency. So it has to be mandated with its number of buildings, a specific amount of savings uh, of uh, carbon dioxide emissions, etc., has to be mandated and accordingly, this will accelerate everything and create a lot of confidence for companies. Two, they have to be some strategically designed campaigns or programs to educate the different stakeholders. Whether sometimes it's the government buildings, even when you try to educate the government buildings, the responsible for or the person in charge of this might be the actual resistance as well. So anyone who's actually in the decision making uh, position to take decision for retrofit or for energy efficiency programs has to be educated. Uh, and that doesn't have to be like long uh, days of training. It's just very simple um, and very short uh, educational and campaigns to raise awareness about the benefits, short and long term benefits of doing energy efficiency programs. I think these are the two short and very efficient hopefully, uh, actions that if we see this happening, I think that would actually them up even much uh, further. I have um, two questions from the audience. Uh, one one is, um, how, how could the public, the general public, uh, maybe be activated to alleviate some of the regulatory barriers? Do, do you see any way for for the public to get engaged in this? I mean, I, this, is, this is sort of a, a brainstorming type idea, but... Um, I mean, the, the public is largely engaged. Sorry, I got you over there. So uh, the public is largely engaged in that they're, they're now, their awareness is certainly more on what is required and pressure is coming on government. Um, I think, I, I mean, in Canada, particularly because we're constantly going through, uh, because we've got so many different level, levels of government, we've got uh, constantly somebody's in some kind of uh, re election cycle. So um, education around public there and putting pressure on the GHG agenda. Um, we, we have our Liberal Party, but our, our um, Conservative Party doesn't really address that. They actually locally, in fact, provincially in Ontario, one of the biggest provinces, recently put the transport way above the GHG agenda, which surprised a lot of people, um, you know, building new roads and things. So I can think of it in that way. Um I'm not sure other ways of directly involving. I mean, that's the only way to affect change in terms of uh, the electorate is to put their ballots at risk. Um, so I think the general awareness that happens around the world puts pressure regionally as well. Um, but I'm open to ideas. I, I think it's quite an intriguing one. I think that there are two two ways of seeing this. Um, because when, when it comes to general uh, push for energy efficiency or reductions of greenhouse gases, we see a lot of that in the in, in, in so general public doing that. When it comes to the solution of using ESCOs, 
as a, a way to do it, that's a bit more technical. So I don't see general public being able to say, okay, let's go for ESCOs. What I see is that, um, for instance, when it comes to industry or other other players, you see that there is a solution where they don't invest, so they will get the, the return, so they will share the risk. So what should be, be um, the pressure is about these more professional people, not so much the, the end user, I would say, but um, uh, asset managers, uh, industry owners, etc., that should push for this type of market and to, to avoid all the kind of barriers that they exist uh, tax barriers or other types of barriers to be avoided in the way that they can perform these investments without um, without uh, going into debt or um, the, the things that we know so and making sure that the, the, the results will be achieved because of the, the model of the contracts that they have. So I think that this is more kind of technical than, than for, for public public um, general public. I can comment while you're on mute. Uh, I, I think uh, I agree with uh, uh, yeah, I agree with George. Um, I, I assume that the person who asked this question is actually in the public, not uh, not uh, not in a position to actually go to fit a business or um, a big commercial building. But energy efficiency is surprisingly the most and first sector that anyone can actually have an impact on. Just be efficient. And that's it. You save money, you save emissions, you save uh, everyone is happy. So anyone can actually do it. Uh, we call it the lowest hanging fruit. So anyone can actually do something today. Now, uh, you just turn off the lights if you don't need them. You don't have to even change the to LED lights if you can't. You just be efficient by using it in an efficient way. You can go an extra step by retrofitting your building if you can. Um, uh, if, if you are a decision maker within an organization, you can uh, advocate for uh, that to happen. Uh, that's still a role of the public. It doesn't have to be. Uh, sometimes it, we we have some cases in the UAE of some companies, the person just a normal employee will actually hear about the impact of energy efficiency and he will go and advocate to the management to educate them about what is this. Sometimes they don't even have access to any information, so someone just. Uh, attending this webinar and you, he will go back to his manager and top management after tomorrow and just speak there's something called energy efficiency and you can save that much money by saving that much energy and the emissions and that's that's an active role that everyone can uh, can do sometimes uh, on the government level changing regulations uh, especially in this region it's it's top down you don't you, you can't have a lot of influence and in actually change the regulations but at least having that small pieces and uh, I think that would add up and hopefully uh, we'll see more projects, uh, more progress globally. Uh, so thanks for whoever asked this question. That was Harry, as far as I recall from the list. Um, thanks, Ahmed. And thanks all three of you for, for these interventions. We, we have actually reached the end based on our timing. Um, I don't know if we should... I have one last question, which I <clears throat> was hoping that you could all three answer. Um, and I think we will end with that then. Um, has any of you observed now in this presentation here, maybe also from, from looking at the draft publication, have any of you observed regulatory barriers in your sort of co-presenters um, environment where, where you think when this is a barrier that, or this is a situation where we have had a, a a model or an idea or a way to resolve this particular barrier to address it. Um, that we think that your your co-presenters should adopt and and, um, and and try to introduce it home. Any ideas? You you also it's also if you haven't that's also fine. I just thought uh, uh, we have exchange of experience here on the screen. I, I've <laughs> I've got one where there's a common barrier that I saw across all of us and that was. Um, timing of of grant money i mean sometimes grant money can be sort of a pain in the backside anyway because it sort of runs across the esco model but uh, seems like a lot of people rely on that but but the slowness of of grant money and the delays that causes and going through red tape and you know am i going to get the commitment in time for my project is always an issue um but one thing i did particularly pick out of um Actually, both both presentations, George and Ahmed, but um, is um, but particularly Ahmed's was um, correct me if I'm wrong is is there's more of a central uh, command structure of we expect you to do 
um, this style of project. We expect you to do energy efficiency and, and we endorse or we have a, um, we, we agree that the energy performance contract is not the silver bullet, but is, is certainly a, a good way of getting this achieved. Um, so I saw that. I mean, that we have, I, I know that from the UK exists from the center there. We, it just doesn't exist here in Canada. It's a please, it would be very nice if you would type scenario. So. And, and George, because it's it's a smaller market and you have, you know, um, sort of in, in the south, you've got Lisboa and the, uh, the north, you've got Porto and sort of everything sort of, correct me if I'm wrong, centers around those two um, sort of areas of government, as it were. So, again, it's it's a very simplistic form of government command control type scenario. So that's something I think Canada certainly could learn. Yeah. Um- on the other hand, the fact that it's simple, sometimes it's hard to, to move on, on it. Um, although it's a, um, a small country and, and supposedly a simple, simple um, um, government structure. Um, what, what we need is this type of commitment towards this, um, the, the, the third party investments and the, the, um, the guarantees of the savings. Um, because actually in Portugal, we are, um, I think that we, we, agree with all the regulation from the commission or, or mainly from the commission. Sometimes we have targets and goals that are higher than the ones imposed by the, the European Commission. So in that point, when it comes to energy efficiency uh, as a, a point, we don't see any, any major issue. Where we see an issue is then when it comes to deliver this. Um, I would give you just a, 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 side, a side note or an example that it's not 100% related with ESCOs, although uh, uh, our ESCOs companies are mainly involved also on, on this topic. Uh, you all saw um, that um, the auctions in Portugal for solar energy, they beat the world record of the price being negative. So it was not a, a even positive price. It was a negative price. So we see a lot of this kind of news, everyone pushing for this market. But then also, on the other hand, you see a lot of news, at least in Portugal, that promoters are trying to develop their their investments. And then they face a lot of barriers when it comes to the paperwork, when it comes to the the things that they need to to fulfill. So we have some some issues when it comes to bring it to the ground to make things easier to move to move forward. So uh, my my or at least in the association, what we discuss a lot of times is that um, we should make things simpler. We should make uh, legislation and regulation simpler than it is, because when you make it so complicated, no one will be able to go through it. So that's that's the, the in my 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 um, my thoughts around this. Yeah, I think mine is too <laughs> short, too, uh, which is. Uh, we cover different sectors as well, not just energy efficiency. And what we notice on the other sectors, whether it's mobility, finance, uh, hydrogen, the region has very unique challenges, uh, which are different from other countries or the other regions. When it comes to energy efficiency, the challenges are globally the same. Like, uh, I don't know if that's something good or bad, uh, but I think that means this that the reason or uh, the need for a global ESCO network, which is uh, what Sony started, is very essential because basically uh, having this uh, global exchange of information and the, and the experiences would help accelerate solving these challenges across the different countries in the globe. So uh, looking forward to connecting with everyone. Uh, and uh, I forget the name of the city where the event will be happening next week. Thunderbird. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Yes, correct. We, we're actually having a, an event with, uh, with IEA in, uh, in Denmark uh, next week, where we're also going to, to present a bit of the results of uh, our analysis here. I'm, I'm very happy that, that um, the, your observation, Ahmed, that, that, that the energy efficiency challenges, or ESCO challenges, seem to be more, more or less the same all over the world, and that there's a reason for having a global ESCO network. We, 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 we feel the same. Um, and uh, we hope that we are able to fill at least some of the gap um, by the kind of analysis that we're doing. Um, we have particularly um, uh, in, in our library uh, established a, a, a part which is uh, dedicated to collecting uh, standard contracts. Uh, so we think that is one of the, of the main issues that we actually can do and where we can learn a lot from each other 
there are standard contracts out there uh, in different markets. And if we can can sort of narrow in to some very basic principles for these contracts, uh, maybe that's a contribution that that we can that we can bring uh, to the table from the global escrow network, at least in the regulatory barriers uh, regard. Um, we have reached the end of uh, our presentation. Um, we have not reached the end of uh, the analysis of regulatory barriers. Our launch today is, um, we call it the first edition. Uh, there will be a second edition and a third edition. We plan to uh, update the publication once a year uh, with new countries uh, on board and in the process of interviewing more uh, ESCO uh, associations. I'm sure we will also identify more uh, regulatory barriers that, that will go into uh, the publication. We do not only want to work with countries with ESCO associations. Our ambition is to expand beyond that. Um, which is why I would like to invite everybody on board. If you think you have something to contribute in this regard and identifying regulatory uh, barriers for ESCOs in countries where there are no ESCO association yet, maybe where there are no market yet, uh, there's no market yet because of regulatory barriers, we would be very happy to hear from you and work with you uh, for identifying uh, those markets and, and, uh, and barriers. So that's it um, from us today. Uh, we are at the end of our presentation. I thank our three uh, speakers for their interventions, inter interventions today and look much forward to, first of all, sharing with you the link to the publication that we presented today because it will be up in an hour's time or so. We have all your email addresses, uh, so we will be sharing uh, that with you in, um, in, in a moment from now. So thank you very much um, for today and goodbye.